You're listening to Shoe In, covering the ins and outs of all things footwear, from sneakers to heels, loafers to slippers, and every type of shoe in between. Brought to you by the FDRA, the Footwear Industries Association focused on retail, trade, politics, and fashion. Helping create and enhance conversations on all things footwear. And now your footwear insiders, Matt Priest and Andy Holt. What up, Matt? What's up, Andrew? How's things going? Things are going well, man. Spring's here, and birds are out, and sun's out for the most part. And, and m as happening everywhere. m as are happening everywhere. That's not a local wrestling <laughs> wrestling outfit in Ooh, Old yeah. Town. I'm going to buy you a brand new <laughs> Off the top rope. Sounds like a local wrestling thing. Exactly. m as Exactly. But it's not. It's Mergers not. and acquisitions. Well, as we look at our industry, things are definitely shifting and changing. But one of the, one thing that's definitely happening is uh, companies, large co- public companies, are buying other brands. Yep. For a number of reasons. Some, you know, sometimes they're looking for fungibility issues, a diversity issue as a product to make sure that there's not wild swings if they're too heavy in fashion. Right. Versus, you know, heavy athletic right now is really yeah. big. So. You got some who are trying to build brands in different spaces, and then other companies just go and, and buy existing brands and, and fold it into their portfolio. Yeah, no, they do. And I think uh, to that point, we wanted someone at our executive summit this year and on this podcast to really, who has been in that space in a real thoughtful and strategic way. And that's why Diane Sullivan, uh, who is the CEO, president, and chairman of the board at Calaris, came on. Uh, at the executive summit to mm-hmm. talk about how she's taken a 140 uh, year old company and evolved it with a new name change acquisitions of key brands like Allen Edmonds right. and uh, Malibu Blowfish Vionic. and Vionic uh, and really has, she really does a great job outlining the name change in particular right. in that process because that's, it takes courage to do that for a company that's so old as well as what are the criteria she establishes to ensure that the the merger or the acquisition, I should say, is the right one for their right. brand, for their company. Yeah. I mean, you got to make sure that it fits your product categories. And yep. then all of a sudden when you do that, then you got to fold it into your corporate culture, right? Yeah. And then and then if you, if you look at these brands they're acquiring, they're all over the country. Yep. So they're not just in St. Louis where they're headquartered. They're all over the place. New York, St. Louis, California. Yep. Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Yep. And that's a whole you start talking about the whole diverse diversity issue across the whole country, right? Yeah. So um so yeah. So Diane came to speak to our summit, uh, which we really appreciated. And uh let's go ahead and get to it. Blake, roll the clip. Thanks for doing this. Thanks for doing this a little early. <laughs> um we're talking about transformation today, Diane, and I want to discuss the process of changing your name to Claris from Brown Shoe Company, your 140 year old company. Why did you decide to change it? What did the process involve? What were the roadblocks? Walk us through that whole process, if you will. Sure. Um, I said to Matt when he had given me an idea of some of the questions, are you sure people haven't really heard that story and would they really be interested in it? And he said, no, not everybody has actually heard it. Yep. And, and it is a bit of an interesting one. This was um, in, uh, I think I first started thinking about it in 2013. And, um, you know, Brown Shoe Company, an amazing company, been a, had a long, rich history. At that time, a 134-year-old company. But when you thought about the name of Brown Shoe, and you thought about what the company was doing today, there was a disconnect between the name Brown Shoe, because it conjured up a very distinct image in your mind about what it was. And so I said uh, to the team, actually, initially, and I had been thinking about it for a while, mm-hmm. and I said to the team initially, what, what do you think? I think we might want to think about changing our name. And it was almost to a person. Uh, they said, I think we should consider it. And mm-hmm. went to the board, said to our board that uh, I'd, I'd love to kind of do a little work on it. Found my way to a really interesting company called Lexicon Branding, mm-hmm. and run by a guy named David Plasic. And not an agency, nothing like that. There were a bunch of anthropologists And actually, we briefed these anthropologists on our company and what our vision was and where we were going. And they did a lot of work around, um, you know, what what kind of name did we want? And eventually, we got to the Latin word, calere, which meant passionate to glow, because we wanted wanted it to reflect the spirit 
of the people in our company that had built that company you know, for the last 100 years and what we expect the next 100 years are also going to be. So we love that, that meaning about the spirit and to glow. And then we, I took a pause because I wasn't really sure uh, that we had found the right answer because I wanted to find a way that we could actually use our history and our past to fuel our future. And we eventually found this other group of folks that actually dug into our archives even better than we had, had done. And they dug into the archives and they found the Star 5 Star mm -hmm. that is, um, was on the bottom of shoes from the late 1800s, which was uh, all about a, prom a consumer promise about the perfect fit, basically. Mm -hmm. And when we saw that and combined that with the name, we knew it was right. So, um, you know, it was um, not an easy choice. I knew it could be a big bust or it could be the right thing. The fortunate thing is it's not a consumer-facing, yeah. you know, name, so it's very different. If it's a consumer-facing name, you have a very different approach to how you do it. But um, we really think it's made, uh, you know, the... the the challenges of it were fairly, you know, other than the paces that mm -hmm. I put myself through right. and our team that worked on it directly for a two-year time period. It wasn't something we did overnight. Um, and then when we basically announced it, we used it as an opportunity to talk about the ambition that we had for our company, to talk about the values and resetting the values in the company and really understanding kind of where, where we were going to go. So we used it as a platform um, to, to move us forward. So that was in 2015 that we right. did that. Mm -hmm. And the hurdles were, you know, um, actually the biggest uh, feedback that I got uh, from a negative perspective, most of it was positive. Inside the company, extraordinarily positive. Mm -hmm. Um, because we did use the past to fuel the future. In fact, we talked even more about our history and why yeah. and how we were, we were literally the, the company that uh, uh, had, uh, did the first rights and lefts on shoes. Really? Yes. And, and so we discovered more about our own history in that whole process. Mm -hmm. So um, it, was, uh, it was an incredible journey. The toughest part, oh, I forgot to tell you this, so the hardest part was really, it was more in our local community in St. Louis. Hmm that would really, you know, had the question about, well, why, why did you really have to do that? And it, again, it was about, we, we felt it was about describing a different kind of ambition for right. our future. Well, um, I can tell you that in the collective footwear consciousness, if you will, I no longer hear the company formerly known as Brown Shoe Company. Yeah, once in a while it's still out there, right. but, but that's okay. That, you know, it's always life's a journey, right? And it over totally a period is. of time, Things will prove out right or wrong that, you know, if you made the right calls or not, but it feels like the right thing. But it was a really interesting process. I rediscovered the company mm -hmm. and its roots and what it meant and our point of differentiation more, through, more so through that process than anything I, you know, I had done. That's so. awesome. That's awesome. Well, since that time, you've been, and in, during that time, you've been very busy and lots of acquisitions. Let's talk about how you approach your M&A strategy. How do you assess value coupled with opportunity? Right. Um, tell me about decisions that, from the Vionic purchase, Alan Edmonds, right. Blowfish Malibu. You've been, yeah. you've been shopping, so tell yeah. us about that. Well, you know, it, we, we took our time, actually. You know, I, I uh, first became CEO of the company in late 2011, I guess it was. And the company was really... Um, not in the, it wasn't in the right time or the right moment to be really thinking about acquisition at all. We had to really double down and focus on building a much solid, more solid foundation and consistency in our performance um, than we had had up to that point in time. So, you know, we were really focused on making sure we were building the existing brands in our, port in our portfolio, building our capabilities and doing a lot of that. But it became, it came to a point that actually to grow Mm -hmm. um, and um, we had to deploy some capital. And so, um, you know, when we think about M&A today, um, and we talked, you can imagine, Matt, right, because of our company, because of our platform, yeah. the portfolio we have, we, we talked to a lot of different people about a lot of different things. But I would say our, our principles today that we've developed around what, how do we think about M&A would be, first of all, it really has to be a, a brand, right? right? A great brand that has some kind of authenticity and an engagement with the consumer and a story to, to tell. So that would be number one. Second thing, there has to be some kind of growth profile, both in sales and in, and in earnings, mm -hmm. right? So that kind of goes without saying that your expectation would be, would be that as well. 
I think the third thing would be we also would like it to be a creative to the company. Um, mm -hmm. It's really tough as a, as a public company not to have something be a creative very quickly. So that is, uh, that's, a, that's a critical thing. We also have to think about if, if we purchase it or they join our team, right, mm -hmm. can we add value to it? Right. Um, can we help them build something better and bigger, or can they help us build something better and bigger? It's really on both sides. So where does the value come from? So we think a lot about that. Because it's a portfolio, it's a, also we talk a, quite a bit around um, cannibalization, mm -hmm. right? So kind of what are the lanes? And to that, for a while, was, um, we used to sort of have, we used to look at kind of where we think the consumer landscape is going. And I think you probably remember a number of years ago we used to talk about contemporary fashion, healthy right. living, and family. Well, today we've kind of refined that a little bit. And we talk now about, because we want to think about our portfolio within these, these um, consumer lanes, um, right now we think about something called functional fashion, mm -hmm. which is, you know, women are, and men are on their feet, active, doing things all day. They're looking not just for function, but they want fashion together. So we think that's a, tr that's a lane that's really going to be important long term. We also think that this concept of modern heritage mm -hmm. um, is, uh, is a place where you know, it's kind of got a, a, a rich opportunity today. And it's heritage brands that, and, and consumers are drawn to them because of their values. Right. Not necessarily, they want new and fresh and relevant product, but they like the values that these heritage brands have. So we you know, think that space is interesting. So like Alan Oldman's oh, Naturalizer and you know, Vionic actually, and uh, you know, Vince would be in the, in, the, um, in the functional fashion. And then um, we, we think this whole, there's a whole lane still about fashion, self-expression, experimentation, optimism. Again, how women, are really, um, they love fashion, they don't take it too seriously. Um, and so we think that's a big lane. So we try to make sure that we have a portfolio that think is, we think is balanced against those growth areas mm -hmm. um, and where we think the customer is going. So, so that's, that's the last piece of it. So really for us, um, you know, I would have to say probably uh, to date, you know, Sam Edelman actually yeah. was was uh, a Talk brand about Sam. that, that was my next yeah, question. that yeah. brand that was a brand that um, we purchased a minority uh, and made a minority investment in mm -hmm. it initially, and then um, uh, eventually bought the whole thing in. I think it was 2010 or 11, and that's been an amazing um, add to our portfolio. I always say that Sam has taught us. You know, and, and brought to us, you know, as much, if not more, than what we were able to do to, to help to build his business. So that's been a great thing. Um, you know, Alan Edmonds uh, was one that we purchased in 2016. And we thought long and hard about that. We wanted to get a foothold in the men's business. Mm -hmm. And there was something about, again, back to the, the heritage, the brand, what it stood for, its points of differentiation. We really loved what that stood for, and right. there's a whole lot more I can talk about that, but that, that was a, an important thing, um, and it fit uh, the criteria that we had. And then now, uh, most recently, the Vionic acquisition, which again, we think is in that lane of real functional fashion, mm -hmm. the higher price points that we were really trying to get to. We think there's a great team of people there. We think that with our capabilities in development and sourcing, we're gonna be able to help them uh, even do you know bigger and better things, so, right. and it's men's and women's, so we like that dual gender side of it. So, it's never easy. What I always say: these things take much longer <laughs> to find them and to do get them and to have it to have it be um, really integrated well into the company. And uh, and you always learn something. There, not every any one of them is exactly the same. Right, but um, you have that that criteria for which you. You we, measure each we, exactly we, this we do. And, and, and then, again, it's, it's the criteria continues as, you know, once you begin to operate and integrate it, what, you know, how do you, how do you analyze and, and evaluate that, too? So it's, um, you know, we're at this point today that we think it's really now about we have a pretty solid portfolio. Mm -hmm. You know, we, liked, we, we like kind of what we have. We're always talking, but mm -hmm. really making sure we're focused on operating with excellence um, I assume you, this time. you've proven the old adage, some of the best deals you make are the ones you don't make, right? It's, right. Well, I think so, for sure. Yeah. You know, and again, 
um, you know, the, the, we, we had a lot to prove. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, in 2011, 12, 13, we had you know, a lot to prove. And now, you know, again, I think uh, there's a life and business is always in these cycles, right? right. You have, the, have times where you've got to work a little harder at it and mm -hmm. other times where you've got to work hard at it all the time. But where, where you, you, you have to face into some things. So. Yeah, that's so true. Uh, let's pivot to kind of this insatiable focus that the industry's having and broader than just footwear on enhancing the in-store experience for our customers. Uh, we've seen a successful run at DSW on in-store nail salons. Um, Kohl's just announced they're bringing Planet Fitness into their workout facilities. I'm yeah. not sure what that's about. Yeah. Um, how do you approach the enhancement of the in-store in experience at Famous Footwear? How do you think about all that? Well, you know, you, you, we think about it a bunch of different ways, and I'd I, sort of say that, you know, the, the whole experience, it's not just in-store experience, we think about it really across the entire um, journey of mm -hmm. that that customer has, and really even in our own supply chain, we think about it that way. So, um, experience, and again, I don't think there's ever one answer. I think it's also one of those things that you, you continue to work on, and you figure out, and you gauge the consumer, and you listen, and you learn, and you do those sort of things. So. Mm -hmm. I'd probably start with just talk a little bit about Naturalizer and Allen Edmonds first and sure. then flip to, to Famous. You know, with, with Naturalizer, it was again a, a, a heritage brand and unbelievable rich history. And it had had just up and down performance, I would say, still a good solid business, but we had really lost its focus as the shoe with a you know, beautiful fit and mm -hmm. it really had become a comfort shoe. And it was about three years ago, I was getting frankly fed up of uh, having to have the up and down performance. I said, we're going to go back and we're going to really make sure we do this right. And we're going to talk to consumers, we're going to focus on design, we're going to make sure we can prove that we're gonna, we can upgrade that product, have a design point of view, improve the comfort and the, and the, the, uh, the fit of, the, of our shoes. We worked on all that. We did that, we, could, we showed uh, unbelievable uh, improvement in our overall performance on that. We went to the next step, the next step. So we, I said, we are not gonna skip one step in this process, because every time we do, you know, we, we, didn't, we, we didn't make sure that, that we uh, completed it. Anyway, lo long story short, um, we now um, are at this place where the brand is growing mm -hmm. super well very healthy right now. Uh, NPD, you know, we're now cracking the top 10 in, on NPD. Mm -hmm. And we actually just opened, so to the experience side, again, it's got to have all the ingredients, right. right? The experience side, we said, how do we create a new environment for Naturalizer? What does that got to look like? And, and it, we felt it had to come back to being very consistent with the brand and what was true to the brand. And so we opened up uh, on uh, 34th Street near Herald Square and in Chicago on State Street, two new stores that actually aren't just, just about footwear. Mm -hmm. uh, there are certainly that, there, but there are accessories. And what we did is we um, recruited a, a uh, I guess, a, a, a team of different resources of women-led businesses that are putting their products in our stores today um, is all connected again with this idea that Naturalizer was founded in 1927 really about cool. the shoe with a beautiful fit. Mm -hmm. So, so that experience today, when you go into that store, and I'd invite you to go take a look at it, that to me is probably like over the last three years, one of the best sort of soup to nuts go right from your gut mm -hmm. all the way out to really being true with a brand. And then Alan Edmonds, a similar story. Um, Again, the uh, rich history, uh, domestically made footwear, which right. who would have thought we would be, uh, we'd mm -hmm. be doing that. Getting back in that business. That, huh? Getting back yep. in that business. But, you know, uh, that, that's, actually, it, that's actually been something to, uh, that we think, again, turning that into a different kind of experience. So, for example, who, who we, can, we can turn shoes and, send, and ship shoes back in two weeks or less. So wow. the opportunity for personalization at Allen Edmonds, this whole idea that it's uh, they're welted shoes, and obviously that means you can recraft them, right? Mm -hmm. If you can recraft them, that means that there's a sustainability aspect in terms of how the Allen Edmonds brand is, brand is positioned. So we think there's some interesting opportunities there, and as we we've opened up some. Uh, new stores, which are, uh, are actually uh, uh, performing really nicely. We also added something that we are calling the Artisans of Freedom 
oh, collection. Cool. And what this is, again, it's a number of artisans because this is a craft, a real craftsmanship kind of brand. Different artisans from around the United States that make men's products in all different categories um, outside of footwear. And we've pulled that collection together as part of the story too. So those are two good you know, examples of you know, full-on experience that's again tied back right. to the essence of the, of the brand. And then as it relates to Famous Fuller, it's a little trickier because you know, we have four to, uh, five to 6,000 square foot stores. So it isn't just about you know, putting new things in our, right. our stores. And I applaud you know, what, uh, what DSW and Coles and everybody has been doing with respect to that. So we are really focused right now on making sure that you know, 100% of what we do is really on um, making sure the consumer finds that joy and finding right. that right pa pair of shoes, right? Well, more localization uh, in, in terms of, uh, you know, making sure those, those right shoes are in the right place. Um, not unlike a lot of folks, new rewards programs, more personalization, mm -hmm. all of that kind of thing. And then, as you know, we hired uh, uh, Molly Adams, who came, joined us from Disney. And, uh, you know, I would tell you that over the course of the next six to 12 months, you'll see a lot more as it relates to um, how we bring to life that in experience for famous in lots of different ways right. um, in, the next, in the next six to 12 months. It's so very exciting. She's, 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 she's going to do a great job. Yeah, she's awesome. I've had a chance to spend some time with her. Um, and there's an amazing Allen Inman store, DC City, City Center, not far from here. Check it out in the beautiful weather. Go, go see it. There's a couple Allen We just started here. our anniversary sale, though, too. Oh, good. So All right. having a good time. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Let's talk about the future of this industry that we love. Um, there's a lot going on. Payless is gone, um, which we saw coming miles away, but it's, it's now gone. Um, where is that customer going to go? What transformative strategies should we be focused on over the next five years, I think, to build competitiveness within our industry? Yeah. You know, it, those are big questions, and I don't know that there's nobody that really has the answers to, right. to any of that, and I know I certainly, I certainly don't. Um, the pay less thing, who, you know, who knows? If you talk, look at all the data and all the um, insights from everything, there's multiple places that the, that consumer can, can go, and, you know, uh, everything that we've seen, it's Burlington, it's TJ's, those are right. the likely winners on that, and, and, or TJ's and, and, and Walmart. So. You know, I, again, I don't think, and, and Tim actually said it, you know, there, there's a lot of shoes out there. There's a lot of retailers, a lot of other things. It's, again, it's about how you continue to make sure you're uh, focused on differentiation. So I think that customer has a lot of places to go, in, go including, you know, Amazon, right? Right. Uh, to to find, find shoes. So there's not a lack of opportunities for where they can go. I don't know, with, with respect to the transformative ideas mm -hmm. for the future and where the industry ought to go, I, you know, I, I obviously think a lot about that myself and trying to figure out what that looks like. And I, for me, it comes back to a couple of things. It's the, sometimes, really, it's the what's haven't changed, right? The, what, the what's being that you've got to have a real incredible focus on the consumer and you've got to be making sure that you know you're building brands because I think brands again that are authentic that stand for something right. are absolutely going to be the things that that um, make all the difference. So I think it's it's really got to be about about brands. I think the other thing is it it really also has to be a, a, quite a bit around is speed and agility mm -hmm. in in your company, the ability to to be able to move fast, to think quickly, to be willing to fail fast, all those things that you think about, but um, to be moving and, and agile. Uh, continuation of making sure you're differentiating your product and having product relevance, I think is absolutely got to be a, you know, a key, key part of it. So all of those things mm -hmm. in many ways are the, some of the same things, um, but there is new technology, right? That right really helps you get to some um, consumer insights that mm -hmm. I think, you know, are really going to be critical back to having the consumer at the center of everything. So whether it's, uh, and I think you've got a couple of the folks here too, whether it's NPD or First Insight right. or Channel Signal or all of that, looking at all of that kind of data is going to be, uh, you know, more critical to make sure that, um, you know, you're doing the right things. And I can certainly tell you, uh, as we've used that more mm -hmm. and we've become more proficient, our, our hit rate in our business has significantly improved when we've done that. And then I guess lastly, I'd say, um, 
there's this, for, for me, I've always believed in um, this idea that you have to believe that anything is possible. Yeah. You have to have an insatiable curiosity. So all of the what's are kind of the same. It's mm -hmm. the how's that are changing. Mm -hmm. And so, so this, the, this idea that you, it, it really is about the person, the, the human touch, the drive, mm -hmm. the ambition, the, um, you know, the belief of, of possibilities um, in the culture to me are gonna be the things that ultimately are gonna be transformative. So trying to you know, build um, that into your organization mm -hmm. and how you all, all, you know, embody that yourself, I think is, uh, is gonna be some of the most, most critical things. Because I think I even heard yesterday from, from some of your team, right, that they were talking about how, you know, the labor market is tight. And, That's know, right. Access yeah. to talent is difficult. Yep. Very tight. So, so back to, you know, you've gotta make sure that everything that you're doing works really, really well. Yeah. And that you've got a culture of engagement, um, you know, for the teams of people that you have, and, yeah. and have them feel like there's a there's a purpose uh, for, right. of of what of what you're doing, purpose. which That's is right. which is not you know always all these things are always very very easy to say, Hard to implement. <laughs> and then practicing them it's always right it's always in the execution, um, mm -hmm. and what separates I think really outstanding success is. Um, you know, ideas, you, there's a lot of them, but yeah. the execution of, of those is really the key thing. That is key. We have time for a couple questions with Diane. Um, as we close out this discussion, we have one over here. And then just be thinking about those questions for Diane. And please identify yourself. Jose Suarez Impactiva. Jose Suarez Impactiva. Thanks, Diane. Hi, I have Jose. a quick question. I totally agree with you on the execution part. So with respect to speed, Building a culture of um, taking, like you said, um, using speed as a competitive advantage within the organization is not easy. Can no. you give us two or three tips of what you're trying to do? Yeah, you know, I, I think probably the the best um, example of speed would have been something we started um, about three years ago, and it started with this this idea that. We wanted to simplify and streamline what we were doing in the organization. It, we wanted it to feel so much easier for the people that were developing product and working on the teams because it just felt like it had, you know, um, it, was, it should be easier, easier than it was. And when we started to unpack that, because we had implemented SAP, you know, uh, in like 2009 or 10, and, um, you know, we, we got it in, that was great, and we kind of stepped back, did a little work, but stepped back, and it was time to go back and see if we could streamline things again anyway. Um, and so we started with a bigger project uh, around that, and it quickly came to me as we were going through this, this process that we were trying to boil the ocean. We had to come back and focus on, like, one thing, <laughs> and that one thing was speed, because the thing that was going to make a difference was how fast could we get um, product back to the consumer that they loved. Because you could see it, this would have been in like late 2015 into 16, and, and that was that moment, right, that fourth quarter where it was terrible out there, and you know, it, I could, you could definitely see that if you were gonna grow, um, it wasn't gonna come in upfront orders anymore. That, those days were over, right? You had to, it was, it was always been a bit of a dogfight, but you had to figure out how to earn it more. So the speed thing, and we basically said, first year I said, okay, 5%, and we got to test this, of our products need to come through this speed program. And that meant that, um, in, in it was a very simple one that, that first year, um, it, that we would ha be able to get reorders in 60 to 75 days. And I know Dan and Clay are here and they'll correct me if one of the days, the days are wrong, but <laughs> something like that. And then, um, and then the next year we said, no, let's, we're, we're gonna shoot for 15% of the pairs that we source are going to try to come through this, this speed program. Well, guess what? We actually get, every, get everybody focused, right, on something pretty easy to understand. It worked. And then it's sort of taken its own life form after that as we've had to expand it because it isn't always, it's never that simple, right? Um, because actually to have more speed, right, to have more reorders means you've got to have more best-selling product. So we had to come back and, and rework, design uh, how we would 
uh, you know, uh, do fast to market, quick design and response and, and that sort of thing. So that's been, I mean, that's been a, a key piece of it, I would say maybe the best example. Um, and then there is this sense, I don't know if you find it in your companies too, but sometimes there's a sense that you have to be perfect. You know, you want it perfect. And to get it perfect, you know, takes more time. So we've also tried to get this, remove this idea mm -hmm. that it doesn't have to be perfect. Just like get it close enough and let's talk about it and let's look at it. So we I think we've done doing a better job of trying not to be perfect and trying to, you know, talk and iterate, talk and iterate, talk and iterate. And if in a larger company, that's a little harder to do. But I, I think we've tried to make sure that we keep while it's you have to have some process and structure. We have also tried to do it in such a way that it's it feels more entrepreneurial and a little more less a little less structured and a little more informal that allows people to to do some of that. So it hasn't wasn't easy, um, but making sure the targets are clear and simple and something that people all understand and can rally around, and then they can help you figure out how to get there. So that was, I think, the best example. Those those two things of what we've done. Good question. Time for one more up here in the front. Hello, Hi. I'm Sarah from Keen Footwear. Hi, Sarah. I found your statement about the welted footwear and how it has an ability to be recrafted to be incredibly compelling. Um, Keen is a huge has a yes. huge sustainability yes. initiative. But how do you balance something like that? I mean. I love the idea that you can buy a quality pair of shoes and it's yes. something that can be repaired, it can be resold, it can be reused, but let's face it, we're in the shoe selling business. We right. need people to come back and buy right. shoes. So how do you balance a strong sustainability message with the ability to reuse and improve your product over time and still get those consumers coming back to you? Yeah, I think it's it's a great question and it's, it's um, you know, uh, I, I guess the way that I've been, we've been t tackling it, Sarah, is getting a better understanding of the c different consumer segments that we that are really a, um, are, uh, that uh, the Allen Edmonds brand appeals to. So we've done a lot of research around that. So we understand today all the different segments. So there's an emerging guy that's younger and up and coming, and more of a millennial that really loves the brand, would like to be able to afford to buy the brand, but can't can't always, and we've learned to figure out kind of what's the product, what's the messaging there. That we have something that we call the discerning guy, and he's the guy that actually loves footwear, loves Allen Edmonds, buys a lot of shoes, spends a lot of money, highest value customer in that particular segment, so we know how to speak to him. Then there's the traditional guy that, you know, is the traditional Allen Edmonds guy, as you would think about it, loves those shoes, feels like they're a, a signature asset to have in the wardrobe and all of that. Guess what? He, he's valuable, but he doesn't spend as much as the rest of, as the, rest of the, uh, the, the, op, the, the segments. So what we're trying to do is the sustainability piece and the, and the, and the uh, kind of welted product that we do appeals to some segments of that. So what we think as we begin to understand how to build more product and more of that story, because it won't just be welted, that'll be a piece of it, against more of those segments, we'll be able to figure out how to continue to add more consumers, more men to, to, to grow that business over time. Um, but the, that whole messaging around, um, there is a very powerful core of people today too that you know, want just a few fine things. This idea of fast fashion for some people is not where they're going. They want a fewer, more quality kinds of things. And we think that that's a really important part of what the Allen Edmonds um, you know, messaging can be. So it's a balance. Uh, ask me in another year or two years from now, and I'll give you the update on, on how we're doing on it. But it, it, it makes a lot of sense to me. It's, it's amazing when you have a brand that, again, has an authentic story and you figure out, like, because I actually didn't even, I, I, was, I was a little concerned about the brand. You know, I was worried about domestic manufacturing. I didn't know if it was the right thing. I passed on it one time. Mm -hmm. I said, how many things can we be good at? Should we do it? And the thing that eventually when I came back at it, uh, that kind of flipped me over uh, to a yes, um, back to the criteria and right. the principles mm -hmm. and all of that, 
was that, um, that this whole idea of speed, back to speed and back to personalization, and that what people are trying to do to get manufacturing closer to the consumer. And if you start to flip your thought process around that, no, not the complexity of managing it, right? But no, I'm getting closer to the consumer and I can do more things for the consumer today and personalize it and, and, and um, you know, get with, with speed and you name it. It changed my thought process about, about the potential. And it isn't the old recrafting, right? Mm -hmm. Where you can recraft. No, it's this, no, it's a few fine things that, you know, that's sustainable and you can do this. So we've tried to take, um, you know, what are those are authentic stories and then figure out how do you just turn them a little to where the consumer, you know, is today. Uh, so I think there's a, a ton of opportunity and uh, where uh, obviously we're, um, uh, how should I say it, where we, we want it to work but we're also, we can, we can be pretty patient too to make sure that we're build, we, we, we really want to build enough. something to last. And, and that is, that's our company, that's the brands in our portfolio. So we'll, we'll take the right steps to try to do the right things along the way. That's great. Diane, you are an icon in our industry. You're agile as we've seen. Thank you for doing this. We're <laughs> yeah. so grateful for your insights this morning. Please help me in thanking Diane Sullivan. Yeah, so there's Diane, and, uh, and so what's so cool about Diane is that she's personable, she's really thoughtful, uh, and she's conscientious, and so she has, as the as the one that's so keen on protecting the Claris brand right. and growing the company, uh, it's really important that she sticks to her values and executes right. against those values, and it's been hugely successful at Claris, uh, and it's been transformative, and... She's awesome. She's an icon. She's kind of a living icon as we see her. She's one of the game changers right yeah. now in our industry. She was very open in discussing all those different issues. And, uh, you know, she is, uh, she's beaten out the door to get into the show, though. She told me, she's <laughs> like, I want to be on Shoe and Show. Yep. I was like, well, Diane, not just everybody can come on Shoe and Show. I'm sorry. <laughs> I hope you didn't say that. We have a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> the bar is too she low. Knows. She's too high of an icon. <laughs> she has to lower herself. Yeah, she said, well, who's hosting? I was like, me and Matt. She goes, I'm I don't out. think so. I'm yeah, out. I don't think so. Don't count don't me in. So, so we, we, we did an end around and recorded her. But <laughs> exactly. Anyway, gotcha. So. Uh, but she will be on at some point, um, and we really appreciate her speaking at the summit and all the leadership and all the support Claris gives FDRA and That's the right. industry uh, by helping lead on trade issues. And yeah. uh, there are other folks that are plugged in. Dan and Clay are always open on sourcing issues and yeah. things that they're looking at. They're one of the companies that are sourcing around the globe, not just in China and right. Vietnam. It's not a plus one, plus two strategy. It's it's they're looking all over the place. So it's a it's a very thoughtful organization that's as Matt said, it's continuing to morph and change and transform. So uh, hope you hope you guys got as much out of it as we did. Um, and uh, and and again, hopefully we can have Diane on soon if uh, if she really wants to come on and get the hardball questions. Door is always open. Door is <laughs> always open. All right, folks, this is Shoe and Show from Matt and Andy. Uh, we want to thank you for listening. If you have questions, comments, drop us a line. Shoeandshow.com. We're on that Twitter. We're on that Facebook. We're on that social media. Don't worry. You can reach out a number of different channels and let us know. Uh, if you have feedback on our shows, if we suck, let us know. We would like to improve for you. If you have ideas, thoughts, or comments on topics you'd like us to cover, we're happy to do that, too. Uh, but until next time, thank you for listening. Tell your friends about us. Tell your families about us. Um, hire some bots in India to help get our numbers up. Until next time, Shoe In is out. Shoe In has been brought to you by the FDRA, the footwear industry's association focused on retail, trade, politics, and fashion, helping create and enhance conversations on all things footwear. For information about FDRA, visit FDRA.org.